What's up, fanatics? I know it's been a little bit, and I apologize for my delay. But before I left, I was going through my top five uh, horror movies I can rewatch all the time. I've gotten through Demons and Hills Have Eyes, and here we are. You can see it behind me, the granddaddy of them all. My personal favorite horror movie of all time, a movie that I consider is very close, if not perfect, absolutely perfect, and that's Halloween. So what is so awesome about Halloween? Not even withstanding the fact that it gave rise to Michael Myers, who is definitely on the Mount Rushmore of horror villains, if not the, to me, the, the best horror villain, per, bar, bar none. Now, it's close, but he is the best. He's, he stands above them all, all the slashers, to me. Um, but there's so many, there's so many more levels to this movie. It's, it's great on so many different ways. The score, the Halloween score, Guys, you guys have heard it, and it is in. It has been used in, Hall in Halloween um, haunted houses. It's been used. It's been remixed. It's been done over so many times, and it's such a simple score, but it's so haunting. And you know, when you hear it, trouble's about to happen. So that's that's one step. You have John Carpenter, one of the greatest horror directors of all time. You've got uh, Dr. Lo uh, uh, Donald Pleasance, who played Sam Loomis. Michael Myers would never have gotten to the point where he was if it wasn't for Donald Pleasance. Jamie Lee Curtis, who was really getting her career started with this. She, it wasn't her first movie, her first horror movie, but it was trying to kind of like the launching pad for her. And without her... And Dr. Loomis and John Carpenter's direction, Michael Myers would not be where he was. So Halloween is just phenomenal in a whole bunch of, in a lot of different ways. So it starts off with a six-year-old child, six-year-old boy. Um, now we don't know at the time. We see somebody put on a mask, and these these uh, there's a girl and a guy making out on there on on the couch. And they go upstairs. He comes in the house, puts the mask on. The guy comes back downstairs. He goes up walks into this this girl's room she turns says his name and he stabs her kills her so then you fast forward a few years he's been in a mental institution um an, an asylum this entire time so dr loomis who has been his doctor for the entire time he was in there knows what he is he's not a human being he's not he's not a demon he's not a ghost he's a he's a, he's a living breathing creature but from the eyes of Dr. Loomis, from the from what he saw, he's the walking embodiment of evil. So I'm going to go off track a little bit because I've heard a lot of people say, it doesn't make sense that Michael Myers can't die. It doesn't make sense that he keeps coming back, movie, movie, movie. For, and, you know, that's not realistic. If based on the original uh, inception of him, how he started, he is the walking embodiment of evil. To kill him would be to rid the world of evil, and we know that cannot happen. So, if you ask me from from my from my seat, Michael Myers should never and can never officially be dead. It just doesn't make sense. So, anyways, he's on the way to the Senate to the sanitarium, and there's a, there's a transporting. Michael Myers. So they get there and all the inmates, a lot of the inmates are just walking around. A lot of, sorry, inmates, patients are just walking around. And he gets out the car to go call to see what's going on. Michael Myers hops on top of the car, pulls the girl out, takes the car and drives off. Now, it is a little strange that this guy, this, this kid was put in this institution at six years old and now he's driving the car and he drove, he drove pretty well. Like, you know, he, he, he drove pretty well. So the rest of that movie well, not the rest. Uh, the next few minutes of that movie is Dr. Loomis trying to warn everybody of what's coming because he is the only one that really knows the extent of the individual, the entity, whatever you want to call it, that is coming to Haddonfield. He doesn't know why he's coming to Haddonfield, but he just knows that's he just has a feeling that he's, he's coming there. He's, he's, he's seen him for all those years. He just knows, and people are just oh, no. You're making a, you're exaggerating. He, you know, blah blah blah. Now, as he's saying this, bodies are starting to pile up on the way to Haddonfield. So, we go to Laurie Strode, our main character. Her dad is a realtor trying to sell the old Strode house. The old, uh, I'm sorry, not the old Strode house. The um, the old Myers house. Myers house. I'm sorry. 
when she walks up to drop the key off, we see him pop in the frame. Now, we one of the great things about Halloween is the way they use shots of Michael Myers, not just in this movie, in all the movies. They use shots of Michael Myers to let you know he's there when the person involved in the main the, the main person in the screen has no idea he's there but the audience does and that is the the uh, the uh, epitome of tension the epitome of suspense one of the things that whenever you can make the audience see something the main person can't and they know something's going to happen but they don't it's not happening yet it, it, it puts a person on edge. This is why this movie has been so good for so many years. And this is why you can watch it today and get the same feeling today that you could get when you watch it back back in the 70s. So that starts to be the, the theme for the next few minutes. There's a scene where uh, Jamie Lee, you know, I'm sorry, Laurie Strode is sitting in her classroom. And this is my personal favorite of the entire movie. She's kind of zoning out as, you know, I was not a good student. I zoned out a lot in class. So she zoned out, looks out the window and there's the, the car that he escaped in and he's standing behind it, just staring directly at her. Now, the way that this shot was, the way that it was, what was so good about this, this, this shoot, this shot was the way it was, he was in a distance. You can see him clearly, but it was, it wasn't like a close up. It wasn't too much. It was very, very subtle. And the whole time she's looking, the teacher is still talking. So it's, a, again, to show you something that's there. Now she sees it, but nobody else in the classroom does. And the audience is like, oh, that's strange. So then she looks back and then looks back out the window again. Gone. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. So... Then you go you as you go on. There's more of these. She's walking with her with her uh, her girlfriends, and I want you to. I'm challenging you guys to a drinking game. Take a sip of, of, of your drink every time you hear the word "totally" in this movie. It is the uh, it is it is said so many times. It's, it's it's pretty funny, but that's one one knock I have on it. The dialogue, I guess for the for the time, it was good. It's just that the dialogue gets a little dated. But that makes sense because why would you, how could you not be dated in dialogue if you're, if you're making a movie for that time? So it's a very, very small knock. Other than that, everything about it is perfect. So she, they're walking home and more and more of the same where he is, he is either driving by, he is peeking behind a bush and they have no idea still what's coming. Lori's starting to get freaked out. She sees something following her, something looking in her direction, but she still doesn't really know. My second favorite scene in this movie is when she's back in the house and she's looking out the window. There's a clothesline with, the, with these sheets on it and he's standing within the midst of the sheets looking dead at her. So then she's starting to see, okay, something's really, really amiss here. And what makes it creepy is this is all during the daytime. Up until this point in horror, most everything happened at night for the most part. It, it, you you look back at the psycho days, you look uh, it, you know, a peeping Tom and things of that nature. A lot of the outside shots, if there were outside shots, happened during the evening time. So to see the broad daylight when most people think they're safest, to see that happening is a little a little unsettling, you know? So um, movie goes on and uh, she was babysitting that night and that's when he, he, he when the night, the night hits, that's when he makes his move. And some of the most subtle, but the most in creepy kills of, of horror, horror history, center, horror center history is in this movie um and he, the stalking that he did to laurie he did he does throughout the the movie to all of his victims and i was talking to my brother about this i think some time ago we were comparing jason to michael myers michael myers is the one that he'll be looking at you for an for hours you would have no idea and then he would get you in your most vulnerable and kill you whereas jason would just burst through the door he wouldn't care what you're doing he just burst through the door and kill you like there's nothing you can do but michael myers would, would stalk you and you would either you might feel something's on you but you can't do anything about it 
And when you look, he's gone. And the next thing you know, you're 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 gone. So it's just a, a perfect, perfect movie. Now, when I first saw this movie, I was I don't know how old I was. I was young. And I came in on the tail end of it. I came in, it was on TV, regular TV. I came in in the midst of the final fight scene when Lori had gone to the house and saw the dead bodies. And when she ran across the street and this, when she stabbed him in the, in the neck with the pin cushion was when I turned it on and I was like, oh, what is this? So that last sequence is intense. She had been calling uh, her friend across the street to see what was going on, no answer. So she goes in the house and starts to see body after body. And then Myers makes his move, chases her down the steps. She runs across the street back into the house. The kids she was babysitting are upstairs asleep. She's banging the door as he's walking, you know, towards her. They finally get get her in the house. Um, she she tells him to go upstairs and lock themselves in. So next thing you know, she sees a window open. She's freaked out, like, dang, he's on to get in. And she gets on the couch and she's messing with the pin cushion, pulls the pin out, he, he gets up, tries to stab her. She moves, stabs him in the throat or in the neck, side of the neck. He falls down. Here's my biggest thing. And this is the biggest thing I think people have with, with uh, slasher movies in general. That's it. She didn't, she didn't try to follow up. You know, it's, and nowadays, it's like, you know, a person would follow up after all these things. But this is back in the 70s when... All this stuff is relatively new. So uh, he she goes back and gets the kids, and uh, he's like, "I I I killed him." He's like, "You can't kill the boogeyman," because the whole time the kid was like, "I saw I've seen the boogeyman." He was stalking the kid as well too. And um, next thing you know, Michael Myers comes up the stairs. So they run, and this is another one of my favorite scenes. Almost all my favorite scenes of horror are in this movie. She goes into the closet and he bursts through the closet and she stabs him with a coat hanger. It falls down. Again, doesn't follow up. Steps over him, walks away. Talking to the kids and he does his famous, his now famous sit-up. Funny thing about that sit-up, if you guys have ever watched wrestling, WWE, and you know the, the character, The Undertaker. The Undertaker does the, the same sit-up. He got that sit-up from Michael Myers. Um... So that's just a, f a fun, fun fact. And uh, by this time, so they, so he tells him to get out of the house. The kid go out of the house screaming. As they run the house screaming, Doctor Loomis is walking around looking for him, and they see him screaming. So he walk. He, he's like, okay, something's going on. He goes in the house, and uh, Michael comes after after Lori, and just about gets her. And then Loomis shoots him, shoots him six times, and then he falls off the balcony. And he looks down and he's there. And then she's like, was that the boogeyman? He was like, yeah, yeah, sure was. And then he looks back down, gone. And this is the epitome of a perfect horror movie ending. The Michael, the Halloween music, uh, Halloween theme plays and you hear Michael Myers breathing over or mixed in with the theme. And it gets louder and louder and louder. You know he's alive. You have no idea where he is. He just got shot six times and he just walked away. And it's just like, man, if you weren't already scared and you weren't already, already looking behind over your shoulder, you definitely were by the moment the credits rolled in this one. Because he didn't, he didn't die. He's right behind you right now at this moment. That's how you feel when you watch this movie. So I was I've been very fortunate, very, very blessed in my time of being a horror fan. I was able to meet all the Michael Myers with the exception of Taylor. No, I didn't meet Taylor. Man. I'm sorry. I don't have a picture with him, but I met him. I was able to meet and take pictures with all the Michael Myers. Um, I had a long conversation with Donald Shanks, who was Michael Myers of Halloween five. And I have been so enthralled with the Myers character for so many years. I don't, I, I think it's a subtlety about him. It's a subtlety about him that he's a very efficient, very efficient slasher, but he's not in your face about it. He'll he'll be in the background, then he'll get you when and he, he'll pretty much always get you. So that is, the, this is Halloween. This is one of my favorite. If you, if you couldn't tell, if you can't tell by my excitement, this is 
my absolute favorite horror movie of all time. Okay, now I'm not saying it's the greatest. I think it's it's my favorite, and I can watch it all the time. And when the whole thing with the greatest is is subjective. Does greatest mean scariest? Does greatest mean well put together? You know what what what? How do you determine the greatest horror movie? But it is my favorite horror movie. If you see behind me, the mirror that I've got is signed by Nick Castle. Great guy. I've met him a couple different times, but excuse me, great guy and. Um, I can just go on and on and on. This is this. If you have not seen the original Halloween, I implore you to watch it right now. Stop what you're doing and go watch it right now. All right. Anyways, guys, glad to be back. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you like this video, leave a like. If you like horror, leave a like. If you know someone else likes horror, share this video. I do these. This is this is what I do. I absolutely love everything horror i talk horror and i you know my my girlfriend gets, gets tired because i talk her ear off about horror so i love talking about it i love being in the horror lifestyle in the in the horror world i'm a horror author i love it so if you know anyone that likes horror as much as me share this video if you want to see more of these videos subscribe to the channel i will be doing these every sunday and every Wednesday going forward, okay? I am I am dedicating myself to you guys, the, the viewing public, every Sunday and every Wednesday, you will see a new video from me. The next one will be my next, uh, I've gotten two, two, through three of my top five. I'll do my next one, which will be session nine. If you guys have not seen session nine, that is also, that's, I'll, get, I'll talk about when I get there. But anyways, guys, Thank you for tuning in. I really, really appreciate it. Again, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.